Okay, so we are focusing on the flow duration curve and uh, the message that I would like to deliver to you at the beginning of this lecture is that the flow duration curve provides uh, plenty of information, a lot of information on the river flow regime. It's uh, an excellent uh, graphical way of uh, making a summary, making a synthesis uh, of uh, what's going on into the river in terms of river flows. First of all, if you look at the flow duration curve, you can get uh, an idea of the variability of uh, the river flows. Basically, if you have a flow duration curve that uh, is uh, very steep in its left part, if you look at this figure and if you look at my mouse, if it is very steep around here, this means that uh, you have uh, uh, um, you have a lot of variability. And let me take a graphical blackboard in order to give you to draw with you a scheme. Just one second, I need to start a graphical window. So here we are, and then by let me see. Nine new. Okay. Okay, let me take the blackboard with me. Good. And one second. I need to. Give me one minute more. Here we are. Okay, just a second. Okay. So, okay, very good. One second, because I cannot get it working, and uh, you have to be patient a little bit. Uh, let me see. I think the reason is that I I need to. Uh, okay. Okay. Now here it is. Just one second. Okay. Perfect. And OK, perfect. Very good. Now. OK. OK, I am almost ready. One second. Perfect. OK. Good. OK, I am ready with the blackboard, so let me just share my screen. 
and uh, let's get the blackboard here. Okay, very good. So now you can see the blackboard. Okay, so let's try to depict the flow duration curve. Let's see. And uh, it is uh, a very rough uh, picture what I'm drawing. So here you have the duration in the horizontal axis and the river flow in the vertical axis. And now let's uh, draw uh, two different flow duration curves. This one, which I am depicting now, is one possibility. And now let me take another one, which is, as you see, it starts from the same point, but it's steeper at the beginning. Now, if, uh, uh, if you look at the red curve, which is steeper at the beginning, it means that there is more variability because you see that uh, from uh, the very high flows uh, at, and the region, the region of the very high flows is more or less this one. This is high flows. From this region, for increasing duration, you rapidly go down with the river flow, which means that uh, the high flows last for a few days only. And this is an indication of the fact that you have in this river regime the uh, unfrequent occurrence of very high flows which are superimposed to a much lower river flow regime. If you look at the blue curve, instead the high flows last for more time. So the red curve is much more variable and uh, indicates a situation where you have less flow into the river with respect to the blue curve and therefore it's uh, a less convenient situation if you want to use uh, the water resources if you want to take water from that river for civil use for irrigation the red curve is a less useful situation because uh, of course you have in that case uh, a reduced volume of river flow. Remember that the overall volume that you take from the river during the observation period is given by the area which is below the flow duration curve. And therefore, if you see the red flow duration curve here, the area below it is much lower than the area below the blue curve. So in general, it is a less convenient situation if you want to use the water resources for some reason. And also the red curve tells you that in front of a reduced availability of water resources, uh, you, have, uh, you may have the possibility that you suddenly get very high flows, uh, which is uh, a dangerous situation because, <clears throat> of course, uh, if you have a river that on average is designed by nature for conveying less river flow, it means that when you get the very high river flows, this designed river, it's, uh, it's more risky because uh, again, it was designed by nature for conveying on average lower flows. So it's more risky when it gets, uh, uh, when it gets the very high flow event. Also, if you look at the shape of the flow duration curve, you may, let me change the color again, and let's get another color like this one. So you may get a situation where the flow duration curve goes down and uh, collapses over the horizontal axis, which means that the river flow goes to zero for a duration which may we may indicate with D star, which means that uh, for longer durations with respect to D star, we have uh, the river that is dry. So let's suppose, uh, let's suppose that D star is equal to, let's say, uh, 200 days. Uh, in this case, uh, I am expressing the duration not in relative terms, not in percentage, but I am expressing the duration in days. Uh, which is implicitly referred to 200 days over 365. It, it refers clearly to the one year period. So what does it mean, this uh, light blue curve? It means that uh, 
for 200 days on average during the year, you have water into the river, but for the remaining 165 days, uh, you, the river is dry. So even in this case, uh, you can understand that the flow duration curve conveys uh, a very important information. Very good. Uh, now let's go back to the figure that I, sh I have shown to you before, which is this one. You see here that this figure gives to you a representation, a qualitative representation of uh, the river flow regime, regimes that correspond to different durations in the flow duration curve. Remember that in general, in, uh, in the context of technical design, when we talk about a flow duration curve, we refer to the average flow duration curve during the year, which means that the duration can be expressed in days, like I did before, or if it is expressed in percentage terms, like 90%, we implicitly mean 90% of the year. So if we don't give any other indication, if we don't specify the observation period to which the flow duration curve refers, we usually implicitly refer to a duration of one year, which is, uh, of course, motivated from a technical point of view because uh, uh, it's uh, one year, it's uh, the period of seasonality. So if you look at this flow duration curve that you see on the screen, you see that in blue, it is uh, highlighted the uh, what is called the interval of the flood flows. And then in green, we have the high flows and then intermediate flows and then low flows. From the point of view of uh, uh, water resource system design, we are often interested in the domain of the low flows and uh, because it's clearly the domain of uh, what we may get uh, from the river during the dry season. And the dry season is the season where our water resources problems are more relevant. On the other end, if we were interested in designing flood protection structures, we may refer to the blue domain of the flood flows and the green domain of the high flows. But there is one important thing that I wanted to tell you here. You see that this figure refers explicitly to flood flows, but in general, the flow duration curve, it's not used for estimating flood flows. The flow duration curve is typically used for estimating water resources availability. So with reference to the low flows, again, it's not used to get an estimate, to get a representation of the flood flow regime. Usually we use different methods for estimating flood flows. What is the reason? What is the reason why we don't use the flow duration curve for getting a representation of the flood flows domain? The reason is that in order to estimate the flood flows, you need a very long observation period because flood flows, they don't occur every year. Again, flood flows, they don't occur every year. They occur once in uh, typically 30, 50, 100 years. So you don't get, you cannot get an estimate of flood flows if you had an observation period of 10 years only because uh, you know, floods are exceptional events. It is different for, if we refer to low flows, and uh, let's refer to the typical situation that we observe in summer, and we call them low flows. This, this is a situation that occurs every year. So even with a smaller, shorter observation period, like 10 years, you can get a good picture of what happens with regard to the low flows. Now, the flow duration curve, as I said, 
it is mainly conceived to give a representation of the low flows and therefore we suggest that the observation period for its estimation does not need to be very long. Usually we say from a technical point of view that if you have 10 years of observations, of daily observations of river flow, these are enough to estimate the flow duration curve. So for this reason, the same tool cannot be used for estimating both. So if we wanted to use the flow duration curve for estimating uh, flood flows, uh, we would need to get an observation period that is much, much longer. So we prefer to separate the two different tools, the flow duration curve for water resources management for low flows, and then we say that 10 years of daily observations are fine. Another method for flood flow estimation, which we don't consider, we don't discuss into this subject. I hope that the situation is clear. If it's not, just let me know. I wonder, in fact, if you have any questions so far, let me look at the chat. No, nothing new here. Very good. OK, now let me uh, refer to a PowerPoint to move forward. And uh, just one second, F5. OK, this is the PowerPoint of our lecture. Let me get to the flow duration curve to the image that we just saw here. OK, now we have clarified uh, what are the different regions of the flow duration curve, and uh, we have clarified the main purpose of uh, the flow duration curve. Now let me focus uh, on uh, the technical question. So if you have a flow duration curve like this, how we can use it to assess water resources availability in practical terms? Like, let me formulate the question in very practical terms. Suppose that you have to design a small hydropower plant, a run of the river hydropower plant. What is a run of the river hydropower plant? It's uh, an hydropower plant that is uh, precisely placed into a river without building any reservoir. The hydropower plant uses the running water, not stored water. OK, so let's suppose that we want to on this river for which we have estimated the flow duration curve that you see on the screen. Let's suppose that we want to design this run of the river hydropower plant. So the question is, what is the design flow? And this is a big question because uh, when you design a water supply system, an hydropower plant, an irrigation system, your main question is the design flow, which means the max capacity in terms of water usage of uh, the structure of the water supply system of the hydropower plant. So keep in mind that this question is relevant because if you increase the design flow, you increase the construction costs and the maintenance costs, and uh, you may use uh, the system at its max capacity only for a reduced number of days in the years. And uh, now let me go back to the graphic blackboard. And just one second, I need to share the screen and share it again. And uh, it's here. Just one second, and here we are. So let's suppose that you have a flow duration curve like this, for instance. Let me draw another one. So here I get another flow duration curve. OK, this is D and this is Q. And let me depict the flow duration curve here. OK. Now let's suppose that your design flow is this one. Q star, OK, Q star, it's our design flow. To this design flow, we have, as I said, uh, a 
construction cost and the maintenance cost. What is the number of days uh, on average in a year that you use the system at its full capacity? Now we have to the design flow to go down to the vert to the horizontal axis, and here we get a duration d star. This is precisely the number of days in a year that I use the system at its full capacity. Because I got a very high design flow. Now let's suppose that we get a lower design flow. So let's suppose that we get this one Q prime and it's this one. So what is again the number of days to in which I use the system at full capacity? It's D prime, which is much, much longer. It's a much longer period in which I use the system at full capacity. So you see that uh, also you have to take into account that a system that works at full capacity works uh, at its max efficiency. If a system works uh, at reduced capacity, we have energy losses, uh, water losses that are more relevant. And therefore, what uh, you want to do is uh, to, from an economic point of view, you want to minimize the costs and you want to use the system at full capacity. On the other hand, if you use a design flow that is equal to Q prime, you reduce the flow volume that you use because, of course, you have a, um, you have a system that cannot convey high flows. So, Everything is uh, greater in terms of flow with respect to Q prime is lost. You cannot use it. It's not lost. It goes into the river. So from the point of view of the environment and nature, it's much better. But, but from the point of view of the engineer, of the water user, of course, uh, the more water we get, uh, the happier we are. And therefore, if you use Q prime as a design flow, you lose uh, the, some potential benefit. So on the one end, if you increase too much the design flow to Q star, you get uh, uh, less com economic convenience. On the other end, with the Q star, you use more water, more water at a higher cost. On the other end, if you lower the design flow to Q prime, you save money, but you don't use much water. For instance, and going, uh, let me use a paradox. Uh, if your design flow is zero, you don't spend anything. So you save all of your money, but on the other end, you don't get any water. So this is a, not an ideal situation. And therefore, it is clear that we have to reach a compromise solution. So what is the optimal value of the design flow? This is our technical question. Now, let me go back to, uh, to the PowerPoint. which is here and let's uh, get this. Uh, uh, let's reply to this question. Estimation of design water withdrawal. What we need to do is a cost benefit analysis because of course on the one end, as I said, we have higher costs related to to uh, construction cost, maintenance cost. On the other end, uh, we have uh, uh, we have the issue of uh, benefit uh, that we can derive from water. For instance, there might be a situation where you urgently need water, no matter the cost. Uh, and in this case, you would increase the design flow. Conversely, there might be a situation where you absolutely need to save money to minimize the costs related to water supply. And in this case, uh, you would, uh, of course, uh, uh, prefer a lower design flow. So. I give you a rule of thumb, which refers to run of the river hydropower plants, but it can be extended also to water supply systems. It is usual practice with these plants to adopt as design to adopt, sorry, as design flow, the river discharge with a duration of about 60 days. And let's say in percentage terms is a river duration, which is varying from 15 to 20 percent of the year. And now, once uh, the, uh, the uh, design flow is defined, 
you can estimate the volume of withdrawn water. So let me just refer again to the graphic keyboard and let me open another another window just one second and let me do like this file new okay because i think it is very useful that now to to better explain what i mean it is useful that i make another figure so let me go back to the blackboard here we are and again let me estimate let me this let me draw a flow duration curve oops sorry i need to make it very large so we have duration here and the river flow here and let me now try to make uh, a sketch of a flow duration curve. This is a bit exaggerated in scale. Let's suppose that this is our flow duration curve and here I have a duration of uh, 365. Okay, good. And here I have a duration of one. Keep in mind that the flow duration curve never goes to a duration of zero. It may go to a duration zero is here. It may go to a duration of one. It may go to a duration of uh, a number between zero and one, but never goes to zero because uh, with a duration of zero, you have the river flow that tends to infinity. So it's asymptotic to zero. It doesn't refer the flow duration curve never to a zero duration. Now, uh, here, let's suppose that you have a design flow that it's uh, Q star, which is here. OK, very good. Now, what is uh, the withdrawn, withdrawn flow duration curve. One thing is the red curve, which is uh, the natural flow, natural flow duration curve. What is the duration curve of the withdrawn flow? It's precisely the blue dashed line which starts for from the design flow which is kept until we intersect the flow duration curve up to here remember we are talking about withdrawn flow so the withdrawn flow is equivalent to the design flow until you have enough water into the river. When you have the red curve, which is water into the river, that is higher than the blue curve, it means that in the river you have more water with respect to one, what you want to take. And therefore your withdrawn flow is precisely equivalent to the design flow. Let me remove the blue circle because I want to keep uh, the figure very simple now from the intersection on for higher duration what is your withdrawn flow it is lower than the design flow because you don't have enough water into the river so add i to to use again the blue color to depict uh, the withdrawn flow with a dashed line i would follow precisely the natural flow duration curve. I am drawing this line a little bit lower with respect to the red line, but actually for the sake of clarity, but actually 
they are they should be superimposed because again from this intersection on i am i need to follow the natural flow duration curve because my design flow is higher than the water that is into the river so it means that i will get all the water that is into the river but not more now what is the volume on this figure of the water that i'm taking from this river with the, the design flow q star the volume as i said is the area beneath uh, below the flow duration curve so this is the volume i am just with the, these blue lines highlighting the volume this is the volume that i am taking Okay, so this is what I meant to say when I meant to say when I said once I define the design flow with the flow duration curve, precisely with the withdrawn flow duration curve, I can estimate the volume that I'm getting from the river, the volume during the year, and uh, implicitly on average, because I assume that the flow duration curve was estimated over at least 10 years and therefore I'm getting an average estimate. Do you have any questions so far? Is it clear? OK, good. Now. There is one thing to say, actually, I cannot take all that water. Because if I take uh, all the water that I identified with the blue area. This would mean that. I leave the river dry. And when do I leave the river dry? I leave the river dry in this range from the intersection between the two curves and the end of the period. This is the period where I leave the river dry. The river is not dry in this period here because I cannot take the whole water why i cannot take all the water from the river in this no dry period simply because the design flow of my plant is lower than the flow into the river so if i adopted this strategy getting the design flow up to the design flow for the whole year long, I would get a split of the one year duration in two periods, no dry because I still have some left water into the river and the dry period where the design flow is higher than the flow into the river. This is not acceptable because uh, as we mentioned uh, in, um, in, in some discussion, we need to keep into the river the so-called environmental flow. And this is uh, um, an awareness, uh, a precautionary action that is dictated by the law in force in most of the countries. Again, which means that uh, you cannot leave the river dry. You have to uh, release some water in order to make sure that even during the dry period you preserve the natural environment you preserve the ecosystem this design this environmental flow is to be determined by referring to the laws in force uh, uh, in each country for instance in italy we have uh, uh, for Italy, we have a European deliberation which uh, uh, says that uh, the state members need to define the environmental flow for rivers. And this is to be defined for the most important rivers, those rivers who are um, denominated with the term significant water bodies. Basically, it includes all the rivers that are relevant for any water resources withdrawal. So this is 
something that it's uh, um, we need to apply every time that we design a, a water withdrawal from a river and uh, so in the uh, in the case of Italy the uh, government has delegated to the regions to the administrative regions the task of defining the environmental flow so in Italy you have to refer to the regional laws in order to understand the magnitude of the environmental flow now it's clear that if you release the environmental flow you need to estimate the volume of water withdrawal that you can take from the river in a different manner so we can't use uh, this uh, blue area that you see on the figure to estimate the volume of water withdrawal. We need a different approach. Now, let me clean the figure and go back to then to the estimation. So I am uh, deleting the area and the circle. And now let's uh, include the environmental flow. Let's suppose that it's particularly relevant here and let's depict the environmental flow with a let's see here and let me use uh, a different color okay let's suppose that this is qe environmental flow now the volume of the environmental flow should be preserved so let me now indicate on the flow duration curve the volume of the environmental flow it is i can depict it in this way let me use a straight line. Mm, it's not perfect. Let me see. Let me do like this. I think I need to start from a little bit above. OK. Yeah, sorry. Let me depict again. OK, here we are. So one may say that this volume of environmental flow it's uh, lost in terms of water withdrawal but actually so one may say that okay let's identify with uh, this area as an area of uh, as a volume of water that i need to leave into the river and therefore it's an area that should be detracted subtracted from the volume of water withdrawal but actually, if I want to be very rigorous, the area is to be subtracted up to here. Let me just use another color again. The area is to be subtracted up to here. OK, so let's uh, let's say that. Uh, oops, sorry, this is not the correct color. One second. Yeah, here we are. Let's go up to here. Hmm. Why up to here? Because uh, from uh, this duration, D star on, from this duration, D star, if I go in the domain of the shorter durations, I get some excess water into the river, which I may use to, uh, to feed the environmental flow. So for instance, if I refer to a shorter duration like this one, you see that in uh, this case, so let me focus with an arrow. In this case, I have excess water into the river, which is contributing uh, to the environmental flow. OK, and uh, so let me identify now on the original flow duration curve, the environmental flow here. And uh, uh, let me see it's this one, this segment, it's again 
environmental flow. This one is QE. Why I am uh, depicting this segment uh, has a difference from the natural flow duration curve, the red one, and uh, the design flow. Why I am uh, depicting the environmental flow here? Because uh, for this duration, let me go down here. Which I may call D double D prime. For this duration, duration D prime, I don't need to release environmental flow anymore because it's already released by the river ex as excess water with respect. Uh, do we have any question? Okay. So, because I heard a microphone now, let me deactivate the audio of everybody. So, for this duration, again, D prime, I don't need to release the environmental flow anymore. And uh, because the river is already is already releasing it. So, let me now in the graphic visualize in a graphic form then what is the progress of the environmental flow between the duration d prime and d star and what i need to do is to depict something like this and then i can extend the area of the volume that i need to release for the environmental flow how did I obtain this shape? One second. <clears throat> One second, let me change the color here. OK. This triangle here. It's a mirror of this triangle here. So the excess volume with uh, respect to the design flow into the river, it's mirrored in order to save water with respect to what uh, I need to release for the environmental flow. So coming to my final question, what is the water volume that I can get along the year in this situation? Very simple, it is this area here and be careful of how I highlight it. This is the area. For now, up to now, is the whole area below the water withdrawal duration curve. OK, and here now I have to stop at the environmental flow. OK, it is. Uh, difficult to explain in practice, but actually what I'm doing is to estimate the volume. Below. The withdrawal flow duration curve and then make sure that the brown volume is not withdrawn because it's environmental flow. And uh, if you. Uh, make your reasoning in these terms. So whole area below the withdrawn flow duration curve minus what I need to release for environmental flow. I get the withdrawn volume and uh, we can call it. Uh, let me see what is the symbol that I used in the web page because I don't want to use a different symbol. We can. Uh, we can uh, call it uh, W. This blue line is WMP. OK, this is uh, the withdrawn volume. If you divide the withdrawn volume by the duration, 
which is 365, you get the withdrawn, the average withdrawn flow. This is average withdrawn flow. And this is average withdrawn volume. Good. Any question? Okay. Now, let me go back to the PowerPoint. And uh, Let's look at this figure. This figure is just what I have uh, depicted on the graphic blackboard. And uh, it's uh, slightly different uh, symbols, I'm sorry. Q star, it's uh, QP in this figure. And uh, QE is uh, called here DMV. DMV because in Italian the environmental flow is indicated with the acronym DMV, which stands for the flusso minimo vitale. The flusso minimo vitale is a terminology which in English means uh, minimum vital flow. This terminology is not used anymore, even in Italy. It has been substituted with uh, the term the flusso ecologico. Because, you know, if you talk about minimum vital flow, it looks like uh, you are putting, you are designing something to put the river in critical conditions, which is not our target. Uh, when we design a water supply system, we should aim to the max benefit, of course, uh, from the point of view of the users, uh, and not only economic benefit, but also societal benefit. So we should target the max benefit and at the same time, we should target uh, the max benefit for the ecosystems. Because if we want to work in a sustainability context uh, with the sustainability philosophy, of course, uh, we, we need to preserve the environment so we cannot uh, bring the environment to very critical conditions. And uh, so this figure is precisely uh, what I depicted on the graphic blackboard. And let me move forward by defining a couple of index. Uh, first of all, let me go back to the previous, uh, the previous slide. Uh, this is a question that I may ask at the exam. So please make sure that you understood what I did. And uh, if you have any question, don't hesitate to, to get the word with the micro or with the chat today or later on. I really would like that you don't have any doubt on what's going on. Now, uh, let's define two indexes, uh, which are very useful to give uh, a quantitative estimation of the impact of our withdrawal. And uh, so the first one is the water withdrawal index. Uh, it is defined as the ratio between the design flow and the average river flow in natural conditions or pristine conditions. This ratio is uh, usually uh, can be higher than one because uh, your design flow can be higher than the average of the river. Keep in mind that the average flow into a river more or less corresponds to a duration of 50%. Under, let's say, this is a rule of thumb. Given that I said that the design flow corresponds to a duration of 60 days, uh, you understand that the design flow, according to this couple of rules of thumb, it's higher than the average. It means that the water withdrawal index is uh, often higher than one. Perfect. Let's look at the second index, uh, which is called the water use index, uh, EU. It is given by the ratio by at the numerator, you have um, this average withdrawn flow. 
at the denominator, you have again the average flow in pristine conditions. This index then cannot exceed one. We are talking about averages here. So the average withdrawn flow cannot be higher than the average flow. The design flow can be higher than the average flow, but the average withdrawn flow cannot be higher than the average. We cannot take from the river more water than what is available. So keep in mind these two indexes, which are uh, which are frequently used in the engineering context, again, to uh, quantify in terms of numbers the impact of uh, our intervention. Very good. Now, let me just, uh, let me just uh, give me one second and uh, okay. Very good, one second, perfect. Let me just uh, now make some examples uh, of... Uh, Excuse me. Yeah, please. Okay. Could you repeat what is uh, QMP, the meaning of it? Sorry, say again the, the um, name. In the, in the water use index, uh, yes. there, there is a the ratio between so, yeah. QMP and wh what is... Is the flow? Okay. QMP is uh, the average withdrawn flow. And uh, if I go back to one second to the graphic uh, blackboard, I need to find it. Just give me one second. And let me put here. It's, let me put it here. Uh, you see here, I already indicated QMP as the average withdrawn flow. What is this? It's uh, the ratio between the average withdrawn volume, which is in blue in the figure, which is given by the volume that uh, it's uh, below the withdrawn flow duration curve, below the blue curve, minus uh, what I need to release for environmental flow. And uh, if you divide this average withdrawn volume by the duration, which is 365 in this case, you get the average withdrawn flow. So flow by definition is volume per unit time. So if you get the volume that you get from the river in one year and you divide it by 365, you get the average withdrawn flow. And uh, if you keep this in mind, you can understand that the volume that you get from the river in one year cannot be higher than the volume that is available. So here, the blue area, the blue area here cannot be higher than the area that is below the red curve. The red curve is the natural flow duration curve. I'm not sure if I was uh, clear enough. Yes, you were. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Also, thank you for the question that gives uh, also the opportunity to to check if everything is clear. OK, now let me give you an example. This example is uh, re it refers to the run of the river hydropower plant of Isola Serafini on the Po River. To introduce it, let me go back to the web page because there are more figures. Here we are. Here is uh, uh, a couple of figures related to Isola Serafini. This is a run of the river hydropower plant. How it is structured? You see the picture in the red rectangle. This is the Po River that flows uh, from uh, the lower part of the picture to the higher part. So if you look at my mouse, it flows, let me see if I can copy the image and put it here, just one second. And uh, here it is, okay. And one second, I expand it because in this way I can write 
here on the figure. OK, so this is the Po River. It flows in this direction. It flows from here to downstream here. And then this is a meander here. And then given that it's a meander, it goes in this way. OK, this is the natural flow. Again, it's a meander and uh, the idea was uh, to cut the meander. Of course, you have a difference in elevation of the water level between upstream. So between let me use another color. Between here and here, you have a difference in elevation. In terms of water level, which is given by the fact that you need to lose some energy to uh, to get the water flowing downstream. So the idea was uh, to make a cut here. And this is the cut. So. This is an artificial channel that was created by cutting the meander. And uh, and to place on this artificial channel. The. A barrage, the barrage is here. This is a barrage. And uh, where turbines are located, and therefore they put another barrage here. The idea was to force the water to deviate through the barrage and uh, and therefore to get uh, the flowing water rotating the turbines. You may ask me why didn't they put uh, the turbines directly on the second barrage? So if you look at uh, why didn't they put uh, the turbines directly here? Therefore saving, uh, uh, saving money for cutting this channel. The reason is very simple. If you shorten the distance, the travel distance of the river, you save energy because in order to travel, the water dissipates energy for friction. If you minimize the distance, you save energy and this energy can be recovered through the turbines. So the reason why they decided to cut the meander is uh, to increase the energy that can be taken from the turbines. And uh, e of course, they keep some water into the meander, which is the environmental flow. On the other end, uh, they can use uh, the water flowing into the new cut to make energy. Of course, uh, the higher the flow, the higher the energy and uh, the higher the head, so the higher the difference in elevation between the two blue points, let me make them larger. The difference in elevation between this point and this point, the higher this difference in elevation, the higher the energy. So the amount of produced energy depends on the flow and on the head. The head again is the difference in elevation between the two blue points. It's interesting then to use the flow duration curve with some additional information put into it to estimate the amount of energy that we can produce here. Let me remove now the graphic blackboard. And let me go back here to these uh, figures you see diversion canal what I call the cut is called here diversion canal you see the secondary barrage here and here there is a picture of uh, the secondary barrage uh, here there is a picture of the power house and uh, turbine row and uh, here there is a technical drawing but what is important, what is interesting to see is this uh, representation of what. Uh, so first, uh, 
the natural flow duration curve, you can have a look at my mouse that is running through it. Okay, so the black line is uh, the black thin line is the natural flow duration curve of the Po River. Now, if you look uh, at the black thick line, which I am going along with the mouse now, this is the withdrawn flow duration curve. And you see that it's called here usable discharge. Very good. So this is uh, the 1000 cubic meters per second is the design flow. So this withdrawn flow duration curve is uh, what uh, we can use to produce energy. Perfect. But I said that the energy also depends on the head. Now let's depict uh, here in the same graph. Of course, we need uh, a secondary scale. Let's depict here the upstream water level is the upper blue line. I am running through it with the mouse. This upstream water level is constant. Why is that? Because of course we have barrages, we can regulate it. Now let's depict the downstream water level. It is uh, the lower blue curve. And this is varying because downstream we cannot make any regulation. Perfect. So the purple arrow is the user, the head. At a given at any duration, you can estimate the head. So the purple curve, which I'm going along with the mouse, is the duration curve of the available head. So you have for a relatively short time a low head. And then with the downstream water level decreasing, because for decreasing flow, you have a decreasing water level. For decreasing water level, you have an increase of the head. Perfect. Now, let's look at the power duration curve, which is uh, uh, what is interesting for us. It's the red thick line. This power duration curve increases for a range of shorter durations. Why is it increasing? Because the withdrawn flow is constant and the head is increasing. So constant flow, increasing head, you have an increasing power. And the power increases up to the intersection between the design flow and the natural flow duration curve. Here we have the head that is still weakly increasing, look at the purple line, but the usable discharge is decreasing a lot, and therefore you have a decrease of the power duration curve. So I think this is an interesting example of what we can do with the, with the, the uh, flow duration curves uh, to estimate the benefit that we can take uh, by a given design design water withdrawal perfect now <clears throat> any question on this example good now let's go back to here this is uh, a map that you can find on my website of a river barrage, which is another example of a run of the river hydropower plant. This is taken from Google Earth. It's directly embedded into here and uh, it's on the Danube River. The good thing is that you can zoom with a very good a very good resolution. And uh, if you zoom over this barrage, you can see also the cars, etc. You see several details which are interesting. And let's go from the right, uh, the right uh, levee of the Danube to the left one. 
And if I go from the right, for instance, first of all, the flow is from the left to the right of the figure. And you see that there is over the barrage, there is a road, first of all. And uh, you have here what you see here under my mouse. Uh, it's uh, an hydropower plant. So basically, what is the purpose of this barrage is uh, to sustain the water level to allow navigation. And uh, but on the other end, uh, by doing that, they create uh, a difference in elevation between upstream and downstream. And therefore, they can use this head in order to produce hydropower. Now, let's go along the barrage. Here you have the gates that allow you to, the main gates allow you to regulate the water level upstream. Of course, you close the gates when you need to raise the upstream water level. And then if you go on the right, there is a secondary there is another hydropower plant here. The reason why there are two plants is that the Danube is uh, is drawing the boundary between two countries, and therefore they wanted to make the benefit symmetric for the two countries. And here you have uh, the navigation dock that allows uh, allows. Uh, uh, the boats uh, to go from upstream and downstream and vice versa. And uh, here, sorry, here you see that there are what are called the Porte Vincian in Italian, the gates that allow you to manage the navigation dock. You may wonder what is a navigation dock. There is a nice example in Wikipedia. Let me open uh, a nice figure in Wikipedia. Wikipedia navigation doc. I think. Uh, uh, it's uh, just one second. I think it's much better if I look at it here because I copied this figure in my web pages. I don't, I just have to remember what is. Uh, I think it's something here. Let me see. Just one second, I need to find it. It's interesting because it's a nice animated figure which is uh, uh, explaining how it works. One second, I think it's... No, it's not here. Give me one more minute and... Uh, let's see. I don't think it's here, but let me check. No, it's not here. I think maybe here. It's not here, so give me last attempt. If I don't find it, I will send you a link. Let me see, I don't think it is here. No. Strange, let me see. No, I already checked this. Okay, so I make another attempt with Wikipedia. Wikipedia, just one second. Wikipedia. Okay, I try in Italian because I'm not sure in English. Okay. Okay. Okay, here it is. Finally, I found what I wanted to see. Just one second, I am expanding it. So this is how a navigation dock works. You see that there is a difference in elevation between upstream and downstream. So if a boat comes, then you open the gate upstream in order to allow the boat to get into the dock. And then 
once uh, the boat is uh, in, you close upstream the gate and uh, you open the downstream gate so that you get the boat uh, going down and reaching the, the downstream water level. And uh, this is what uh, the navigation dock, uh, this, the scheme that you see here, is what is... Uh, just one second, I go back. To, is what you can see here over the Danube, you see. There is the gate upstream, if you look at my mouse, and then the gate downstream. Okay, this is just, I think it's interesting in order to see how they work. So I think that we are done for uh, uh, assessment, uh, inductive assessment of uh, uh, surface water availability. And now I would like to focus on groundwater. But uh, I would propose this, uh, given this, given that, uh, let me refer to the PowerPoint. Uh, the PowerPoint, you see that here we uh, should move to inductive assessment of groundwater availability. I would propose this. Uh, before starting with groundwater, I would like to make the exercise on the estimation of the flow duration curve. So if it's fine to you, I would get now from you any question that you may have. And then I would make the 15 minutes break and then we meet again and start with the exercise. So let me now focus on the chat. Let me share my screen and let me focus on the chat. And please let me know if you have any question. OK, it seems that you don't have any questions, so it's 10.30. Let's meet again at 10.45. Again, I will not stop the recording. And uh, so I don't forget to restart it. OK, see you in uh, 15 minutes. Thanks.
here I am, students. Just one second, I close the graphic uh, windows. Okay. Good. Do you have any questions? Okay, so. I think I may ask you. Um, one thing through a pool, just let me. Let me make uh, a pool here. Mm. One second, forms, very good. Okay. Sustainable design. Okay. So let me ask you this question. Just one second. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay, so my question is this one. Let me see. And it's anonymous. Okay, so I think, let me see. If you can see it. Can you please vote? So I get a perception of uh, of what uh, was uh, the level. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think uh, now seven people voted. I didn't vote, so. Uh, 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 uh. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. Okay, it looks like uh, the majority of you think that it was too tough. Okay, okay. You know, it's um, it's a, um, it's not um, the concept is very simple, but uh, the technical application, I think it requires uh, um, some of uh, considerations and careful attention by you. So let me give you this suggestion. I think uh, you should try to have a look uh, to have a look at the web page during this week and um, 
I, I am convinced that if you make a careful reading of the web page, uh, you should be able to understand because I think it is explained there quite well. But let me let me next Monday because next Thursday we don't have any lecture. But just let me check if it is uh, it is written in the calendar and uh, uh, it's uh, because I have uh, the degree day. So let me check here in the calendar if it's uh, today is March 8. Yes, it also in the calendar you can see that there is no lecture on Thursday because it's degree day. So um, we have one week to, to think about it uh, and uh, uh, please uh, try by next Monday to, to have a look and uh, I'll, um, I'll uh, ask uh, again the question next Monday to make sure that uh, you got it. OK. OK, very good. Now let me move forward and uh, let me share the screen. I am closing the PowerPoint, but let me share the screen. And uh, the screen is uh, here. Good. And uh, let's go here on the web page of the course uh, and let's go to the exercises. And uh, now, estimation of the flow duration curve. If you click here on estimation of the flow duration curve, uh, you get a PDF or not a PDF, it's a zip file. And if you open it, uh, this is uh, the content of the zip file. There is a PDF uh, and there is a um, text file. Now, I suggest that uh, you, you have to, uh, to first let's open the PDF. If you click on the PDF, you should get it. And uh, the, this is the text of the exercise. Let's read it together. Computation here, there is a spelling error. I never noticed it. Uh, computation is written with the M. So computation of the flow duration curve for the Po River at Ponte Lagoscuro. I will need to, to change the PDF. At the river cross section of the Po River at Ponte Lagoscuro, main mean daily river flows were observed since January 1st, 1920 up to December 31st, 2009. Data in cubic meters per second are reported in the text file that was included in the zip file. And please note that in this text file, the data observed during the leap years on February 29 have been removed because it makes the computation simpler. Now, what we I would like to kindly request to you, it's uh, number one, estimate the flow, the average flow duration curve by pulling all the observations together, therefore obtaining a high temporal resolution representation. We will see what this means. And then second, estimate the flow duration curve by computing the average curve from yearly flow duration curves. Very good, compare the two flow duration curves and let's forget uh, the fourth one for now. OK, very good. Now. Let's go back to the zip file. In the zip file, there is uh, the text file. Uh, which uh, is mentioned in the PDF. If you double click on it, uh, you see that here you can see the flows. There are just the numbers from January 1st, 1920 to December 31st, 2009. Only the numbers. OK, let's close it. If you can't follow me, please let me know. OK, write on the chat or step in with the micro. Let me check if no, there is nothing in the chat. Very good. Now, um, what I would like to kindly ask you is uh, to copy the text file in the desktop of your PC. So it's uh, uh, how to do that. It depends on the operating system, but usually if you click on the file that you want to extract from the zip with the right, 
there is extract that you can choose and then it should open a window asking you for the position and I suggest that you save on the desktop. OK. Just let me know if you have any problem in doing that. So this text file is to be saved on the desktop. And then we can close the window of the zip file. Good. Now let's move forward by going back to the web page. And there is a suggested R file which you can click over. If you click over here, you get a sequence series of instructions in R. So basically this is meant to support you because it gives you already the solution. And uh, I think this is the most efficient way that we can follow in order to make this exercise in R, which means uh, to follow what it's already pre prepared, but we need to understand line by line what we are doing. So what I'm now suggesting is that you open a R console and uh, uh, what I let me check if I have also R studio here because I don't remember. I, do, I think I have only the console. So uh, can you please uh, remind me if we already introduced R studio with you? I'm not sure if we installed it already. And because uh, be patient, I have two courses, so I don't remember what I did in each one of them. Uh, did we already install our studio? Can you please write on the chat yes or no? Just one. Yes, we did. Very good. OK, now I think. Uh, OK, we no, have the opposite. OK, not our studio. OK, th th this is fine. Let, let's install our studio, which is, uh, um, I think it is a lucky condition because I don't have it on my PC. So what is our studio? First of all, it's an interface for R. I think it's better if we make this exercise with the interface. It makes R more user friendly. And uh, so let's uh, uh, install it. In order to install it, let me open a uh, web page and let's uh, go to Google. So this is a Google page. Let's look for R Studio. OK, you click on the first link. Very good. Now let's uh, mm, Try our studio uh, team for free. Sorry, one second, because I'm not really sure. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, very good. So let's try it for free. I go back here. I hope this is the correct link. Let just let me check. Uh, no, it's not the correct link. Just one second. Let me see where is the download section. Products uh, open open source. OK. R Studio. Let's uh, let's uh, go to products uh, product uh, R Studio. OK, you see our studio take control of your R code. And uh, just one second, R Studio desktop this is what we mean and uh, okay download our studio desktop you have to go here choose your version and uh, our studio desktop free of course download i'm clicking on download and here you have the windows one and uh, I take uh, 
Ubuntu 18, but you have to take Windows or uh, I think there is also Mac. There is Windows, Mac, and I need Ubuntu, which is this one for me. And then you click on uh, your installer. And uh, what I have to do in my case is different uh, uh, because I have a different operating system, but uh, Basically, what you need to do is to save the file. So I'm doing the same myself. I save it. And then once it's saved, you have to double click on it. So I, I am doing precisely the same thing. I click on it and uh, I need to wait a little bit. And uh, once that you click on your executable, for instance, you may have downloaded the Windows you have to double click on it uh, and uh, it uh, starts uh, the installation like it is happening for me. You see that it's uh, now starting the installer. In your case, it's probably more rapid than in my case. OK, so I install it. I need a password. And then I have to wait a little bit. If you experience any problem, if you couldn't follow me, let me know. It is unusually slow for me, but I, I think it is taking some time to you as well. Let me see. If I can speed it up in my case, just. Uh, yeah. OK, it is good. It is it is perfect. It was installed. OK, now if you succeeded in installing it, you should find it in your applications. And in my case, I think it is under under. Yeah under development and here it's my R Studio window. One second. Now you should get to a similar situation like mine that you can see on the screen. Let me have a look now on the chat. One second, I give you back the screen soon. I just want to put the chat on my other screen because I want to keep. One second. OK. So just let me know if you don't get here. If you have any question, again, let me know. I don't see anything on the chat. Can you please write on the chat if you are not ready to go, if you don't have this window in front of you? Just write no if somebody is still uh, waiting uh, for installing it. OK, so I am uh, slowly moving forward and uh, just uh, again. If you have any problem, let me know what you see on the screen on my screen in particular is uh, 
an R console on the left and uh, two more windows on the right. Okay, there is one student still uh, waiting for it. Uh, while uh, you are installing just uh, two students, okay. While you are installing, just try to, if you are just waiting, try to follow me on the screen. And uh, let's forget about uh, the windows on the right for now. And let's focus on the R console on the left. This is uh, the usual R console. I clean it with Control L. Okay, let me just uh, make my fonts larger. I think it's under, under, under. Just one second. Code plot section tools. Global options. Let me see appearance. Yeah, editor font size. Let me put it 18. Okay. I think it's uh, no. Now the font is a bit larger. Yeah. Now, in the console, as you know, we can put commands like two plus two, okay? And look on the right, in the history, we got two plus two, the last command that I, I typed, because the window in the right upper part is reporting the history now. We can change it, but now you see the history. OK, now. I mentioned to you before earlier that uh, we have if we go to. The web page. Of uh, the course, uh, there is this list of our instructions. Uh, which uh, we need to put into the RStudio console. We can do it with cut and paste. OK, so let me go back to the web page. And uh, the first instruction is a comment. Be careful of the path in the line below. I can recognize it's a color. It's a comment because there is an hashtag. At the beginning, let's try to make the cut and paste. If you select this instruction. And then you right click over it, you have copy. So you can copy it. And then uh, we can change the window, go to the RStudio console. Let me change it. And then we can make paste. And then we press return. And nothing, up, nothing happens because it's a comment. It just remains into the history. Very good. Now, before moving forward, let's uh, set uh, the working directory in our studio. And I suggest, uh, I don't remember where it is to be set, just let me have a look at it. Set working directory under session. Let me go it again. Let me do it again. I click over session. And then set working directory and uh, i would uh, take choose directory and then i suggest that you get your desktop this is what i'm doing and uh, you see that an instruction appeared in the console set working directory and this is the name of my desktop. It is essential because this is the location of your hard disk where your history, your image will be stored. OK. Now I go back to the web page to copy another instruction. So this is a scan instruction. Let me copy it with the right copy. 
and then let me copy it in the R Studio console. Right paste. So for some reason, okay. What is this? First of all, it is assigning to a variable called the river flow. So this instruction is assigning to a variable which is called river flow. It is a vector precisely. It is assigning to this vector the series of numbers that R gets from a scan instruction. What is a scan instruction? It's an input instruction. Scan means read the file whose name is put as an argument of the scan function. So the name of the file to read from is po.pontelagoscuro.txt. You may remember this is the file where the river flows are placed. And uh, where is this file located? In the it must be in the working directory that we just set. Even that I suggested to you to extract this file po.pontelagoscuro.txt in the desktop. And given that I suggested to you to set the desktop as working directory, I believe it should work. Let's press return. So in my case it worked. You see that R says I read 32,850 items. Okay. Now, let me just check how many of you are at this stage and let me make a form again. So it's uh, my question is were you able to upload the data? So it's anonymous, yeah, yes and no, it's anonymous. And I just want to check how many of you are in line with me. So please vote on the chat. And I want you have to say yes if you got the same red instruction that you see on my screen, red this uh, okay so please vote mm. I hope that those of you who didn't uh, get uh, to this stage are still working on it. If you have specific questions, just let me know, okay? Otherwise, if I don't get any question from you, I assume that uh, you decided to you decided to just look at what I'm doing and I can then move forward. If you want me to repeat something or to wait before moving forward, please let me know in with the micro or in the chat. OK, now what we have to do is just to move forward with the cut and paste. We read the river flow data. Before moving forward with the cut and paste, let's plot them. Sorry. Just to have a to to see how they look. Plot 
river flow and let me write type equal line. You see on the right, we got a graphic window with a plot of the river flows, which is OK. I suggest when you when you manage data, my suggestion is uh, to before starting, uh, once you uploaded the data, to make a graph of the data because it allows you to check if uh, uh, something is wrong with the data themselves. OK, you see from here that uh, apparently everything is fine. There are no outliers, uh, no negative values. Uh, of course, when you deal with river flows, we don't we, you don't expect any negative value. OK, very good. So. Let's uh, now. Go to the web page and see what is the next. Remember that with this data we have to build the flow duration curve. And uh, let's look with the first method. The first method is uh, to pull the data together. Actually, they are already pulled together and rank them in descending order. So let's do it. So the first, uh, the next, uh, uh, the next step, uh, the next instruction is to create. Uh, the, the duration vector, given that I have to compute a, duration, a flow duration curve, you remember that the horizontal axis, the X axis for the curve is the duration. So here I have 32,850 numbers. Let's create a vector of duration as a sequence from 1 to 32,850. So I go back and here it's duration. I created this sequence. The function SEQ is created in a sequence between 1 and again 32,850. Now, given that I want the duration between 1 and 365, I divide this vector by 90, which is the number of years. I copy this instruction. I go back to the R console and I copy it. Now, what is now the range of the vector of durations that I obtained? If you want to compute the minimum, minimum of duration you see this is the minimum duration is lower than one and uh, but it's greater than zero and max duration is uh, 365 which is okay and uh, if you look at this vector of durations sorry if you plot the first 10 numbers duration from 1 to let's say 20 the first 20 numbers you see these are the durations and look given that i have 90 years of data this allows me to define the flow duration curve for very uh, very detailed durations I'm not starting from one and then two and then three. I'm starting from 0 0.01 and then 0 0.02, 0 0.03. So it means that uh, the duration is defined with a high level of detail because I have 90 years of data. Had I had only one year, uh, let me let me show you what would happen had I had only one year and let me clear the screen. Had I had only one year. Here the duration would have been defined from one to three hundred and sixty five. OK, this would be the duration and then. The rescaling here divided by 90, I would have divided by one. And then if I show to you the duration from one to 20, you see that 
it's one, two, three, four, five. The level of detail is coarser. Now, let me repeat instead what I have to do, given that I have 90 years. And let me back with the arrow up, I get the previous instructions. Now, let me write 365 times 90, which is 32,850. Perfect. Now I divide, I make the scale by dividing by 90. And then you see that the level of detail is much more. It's much finer. I have more details. Because I have 90 years. So for increasing. Number of years for increasing length of the observation period. I get an increasing level of detail in my representation. Very good. Now we can move forward with the computation of the flow duration curve. Let me move forward by referring again to the web page. And remember, I have to sort my river flows from the highest to the lowest. Let me copy this instruction, copy it in the our console and let's look at the function here. I am creating a new variable river flow one, which I obtain by sorting river flow, decreasing equal true, which means from the highest to the lowest. Good. Now let's have a look at river flow one, the first number. Oh, sorry, I forgot a W. The first number is the max of river flow. The lowest number, 32,850, 32, is the lowest river flow. I mean, the last number in this sorted vector is the lowest river flow root. So I sorted the observations from the highest to the lowest. Very good. This is precisely if you look at the my web page, it's precisely what I have to do. Let's have a look at the web page. OK, so let's not this one because here I need to keep it for copying the. The instructions, so let me go back to my web page and let's look at the tutorials of sustainable design of water resource systems and then let's look at the inductive methods and let's look at the flow duration curve. You see. Pull all observed stream flows in one sample. Rank the observed stream flow in descending order. This is what we did. And then what we have to do now is plot each ordered observations, observation versus its position duration in relative or absolute terms. So what I have to do, let's now refer to the instruction, is plot duration river flow one type equal L. So the instruction plot takes as argument the horizontal axis first, the independent variable, which is duration, and then the vertical axis, river flow one, which is ordered, ranked in descending order. Let's copy this instruction, copy, and let's go to R and let's paste it. And here we are. We already got our flow duration curve. This is the flow duration curve of the Po River at Ponte Lago Scuro. We already addressed the first question of our practical exercise. Of course, this plot is is a bit rough. You know, we we, we should maybe put some colors there. We should put labels into the axis. Now uh, it used the, the default. The default is to use as uh, axis labels uh, the name of the variables. 
and uh, of course we may embellish it a little bit. Good. Now, this is already, as I said, the first question of the exercise, and you see we completed the first method for the estimation of the flow duration curve. Now, our exercise requires that we compute the flow duration curve with the second method. But before I move forward, let me ask you if you have any question related to this first stage. Clear. OK, thank you. Now let's move forward and let me clear the screen. Second method before, uh, let me have a look at the, let's call it theory, before the instructions. An alternative method to compute the flow duration curve from an observed time series is to build one flow duration curve for each year of the observation period and then compute for any within here duration the average of the corresponding river flow across all annual curves. Therefore, if the record counts Y years, in our case Y is 90, let's have a look at what happens. Y annual flow duration curves are construct from the Y year long record of stream flows. Good. From the group of the <coughs> Y empirical annual flow duration curves, one may infer the mean or median describing the annual stream flow regime. OK. Let's forget about the last one. So let's now compute our 90 flow duration curves. 90, because we have 90 years of observations. And you may say, oh, this is complicated. Actually, in Excel, it would be complicated. In, in R, it's quite easy to do. So let's get our instructions. Oh, before moving forward, I'm sorry, there is an instruction here which precisely embellishes the plot. Let's try it. OK, let's copy this. And go in our studio, paste. And let's see. What happens? I don't understand why I can't. OK, you see the plot now is a bit better. OK, and now we can go on with the second method. So in order to compute the flow duration curve for each year, an array is created. We suggest to create an array. I copied the instruction. I paste it in R. So you see that I am creating an array which is named the river flow 2. And, uh, and uh, the array has a dimension of uh, 365.90. Why this dimension of the array? Because uh, I want to make the array in a way that in each in each row I have one year. So you see that uh, the dimension is such that you have 90 rows and 365 columns. 
and therefore each row collects one year. Okay, so let's visualize river flow two. Let's put a comma and then one, which means first row. And this, these are the data of our first year. Just for comparison, let's have a look at river flow, the original data set from one to 10. What I am expecting is to see the first, the same first 10 values that I see in the table that is on the screen. Let's see. You see precisely. This is a check. It means that uh, by typing uh, look above river flow two, comma that one, comma one, I got the first here, the first year. Very good. Now I have to compute the flow duration curve for each row for each year. So I have to sort each row in the sending order. How to do this? In order to do this, I, I, I repeat what I have to do. What is my task now? To sort each row of the array river flow two in the sending order. OK, now. How can I do this? Let's look at the instructions and here I see a four instruction. Let before I comment, let me copy it. And paste it. And then let's press return. And what R says is a plus, which means tell me what I have to do. What is a for instruction is a cycle instruction. A cycle instruction is used in programming anytime you have to repeat a task many times. And then you make a cycle. It is a way to condense 90 instructions in this case, because what I have to do, remember, is to sort each row of the matrix river flow two. The matrix has 90 rows. It means that I have to repeat the same operation 90 times. So the cycles are a means, a tool to condense, in this case, 90 operations is just one. So here, what you see on the screen means repeat. 90 times the instruction that will follow. By each time updating a counter. We need to introduce a counter which tells us. How many times the cycles was repeated? The counter is the variable I. I is the cycle variable. Remember. Cycles and conditions are the basic structures of any programming language. Whenever you learn a new programming language, what we are doing now, we are learning the R programming language. The first things that you have to learn is how to write cycles and conditions. Good now. This is the way in R you write a cycle by using for. And now R says plus, which means tell me the instruction that I have to repeat 90 times. So let's go back to the web page. And here is the instruction. Let me copy it and put it in R before commenting. It is a sort instruction, which is similar to the sort instruction that I did before. But you see that now I am sorting each row of the array river flow two. And the way I change the row anytime is by identifying the row with the cycle variable I. And if I press return, 
the system I sorted all the rows of the matrix. So you see that it was very simple for me to compute the 90 flow duration curves. Now I have to plot them. Let's plot them and let me go back to the web page. And uh, uh, we, we may use this one, this instruction. It is commented in the web page. Let's uh, try to, let's try it. And look, I skipped the hashtag in my cut and paste. And what you see now, the matplot instruction stays for matrix plot. So I did a matrix plot of river flow two. Matrix plot plots for each row of the matrix, what is there. And here you can see on the graphic window, the 90 flow duration curves from which you can see that there is indeed a lot of variability, a lot of interannual variability, which I mean, it's fine. We, we are expecting it. No problem at all. OK, uh, now this plot is, uh, is not telling us what is the average. We are interested in, in the average. We are interested in averaging these curves. So let's compute the average now. I go back to, to the instructions. I first create a vector called average, A, a V, G which is uh, uh, formed by a sequence of zeros. So let me copy this instruction here. And the AVG, if you want to see it, is a sequence of zeros. Very good. Now let's move forward. I need to compute the average for each duration. Again, I use a four cycle. And uh, let me now copy two rows in order to save time. Copy. Very good. Now, if I take AVG again, I have the averages. But let me again. show what I copied. Now I am ready to plot the average because this is what my exercise uh, re uh, requested to plot the average flow duration curve and to compare the flow duration curves that I got with the two approaches. Good. Now. Here is the plot instruction. But again, this is the previous plot instruction, which allows me to plot the flow duration curve that I computed with the first method. Let me get it paste. Just one second. For some reason, again, let me check. Paste. OK. Here is the previous one. And now I have to plot above here the new one. How to plot a second line on an existing plot? Let me go back to the instructions. It's lines. So let me copy it and paste it. And here you see the two curves. And uh, we are done. What's the difference between the two? Uh, remember, the first one was much more detailed. Uh, we said that the durations, the durations that uh, for which uh, 
the red line was computed is 0 0.01, 0 0.02. For the blue line, the duration is one, two, three. So with the blue line, with the second method, we lose some definition, we lose some detail. And you can clearly see through the comparison that it's on the screen that we lost detail. Because you see that the red line goes much higher. Why it goes much higher? Because uh, it uh, gives to you the flow duration curve for a duration that is closer to zero. The first duration is 0 0.01. For the blue line, the first duration is one. So you must expect that for decreasing duration, you get a much higher river flow. And in fact, the red line goes much, much higher in the domain of the river flows because it estimates the river flow for a duration that is closer to zero. And the same in the other extreme, in the domain of the extreme low flows, you see that the red line goes at a lower level, at a lower flow, sorry, at a lower flow because it is more detailed and therefore it goes uh, to a much lower river flow. The difference is clearer if you look at the high flows, but also in the low flows there is this difference. So with the blue line, with the second method, you lose definition. What do you gain then? You gain through the estimate of variability. So you estimate variability at the expense of definition. Good. So this is a typical question of the exam. Please, uh, can you explain to me the two methods for estimating the flow duration curve? And you should explain what we did with this exercise. And the, the next question would be, what are advantages and limitations of each method? And you should say that with the first method, we have a higher definition, but we don't estimate variability. We don't estimate uncertainty. While with the second method, you, with the blue line here, you estimate uncertainty. We are, we didn't estimate uncertainty variability so far because if you want to do it, you have to go on with the next instructions that you see here. Okay, and just to give you an example, I copy all of them, but this is just a quick example. I copy and paste all of them. You should uh, please go through this exercise line by line again to make sure that you understood what you are doing. Just to give you the example, I am cutting and pasting here the, uh, these instructions and you see what is going on on the plot? You have all the curves, you have the average in red, and you have the two <coughs> blue lines, which encompass 90% of the river flow for each duration. And uh, this is the advantage of the second method, that you get an estimate of variability, which means uncertainty, which is extremely important. Okay. Now we got to the end of our lecture today and uh, the homework for you, you have one full week, is uh, to go back to what we learned from the theory today and make sure that you understood. If you are still missing something, next Monday, please let me know. And uh, if you need any clarification, you can write on the chat along the week. And uh, the second thing that I suggest you to do is to go th through this exercise and make sure that you understood line by line what we did today. Today we made a big progress because uh, without realizing it, uh, I, I have a question on the chat I will answer uh, as, uh, just in a minute. Uh, without uh, um, realizing probably it, we today wrote a program we wrote a series of instructions that allowed us to 
perform a task which is a, a program. So it is extremely important that you get the sense of what you did because uh, it would mean that you learned another step forward in programming. So the question on the chat is what to do uh, with missing data. This is uh, an additional question. So it may happen that in some days you have missing data and uh, the missing data usually are in practice reconstructed, which means that uh, if you have a missing observation, for instance, on uh, today is March 8. So if today we are missing the observation, you could put there instead of the actual data, the average between the observation of yesterday and the observation of tomorrow. This is uh, an easy solution if you have just one missing day. If you have a, a lot of missing data, meaning that you have three months, a possible solution is that uh, you discard the whole year. This is a possibility. Or another solution is that you substitute the missing months uh, with the average that you computed on the remaining years. But really, the solution for dealing with missing data depends very much on the application, the purpose of the analysis, and how many data you are missing. Do you have any other question? But by the way, the question on the missing data is a very smart question. It means that you realized the problem and you realized the technical problem because indeed, I mean, when you have to deal in practice with a problem, you, I mean, the theory, what we are lecturing is a perfect situation. You are never in a so perfect situation. You get some practical uh, limitations. And another limitation may be, what if I have only three years of data? Can I estimate a flow duration curve? I would say it depends on the purpose of your analysis. If you, I mean, three years of data is more than zero information. But of course, you have to be aware that with three years, there is a lot of uncertainty in the estimate. It depends on the purpose of your application. But I, I really like very much when you, when you uh, have technical questions which prove that you got into the technical context of what we are doing. Remember, we need to get into the practice of it. So we are successful when we know how to do things. We are engineers. Any other question? Okay, students. Uh, so I think that I can stop then the recording.